Welcome to Psychology of Daf. We are in Gemara Erevin, Daf Tes Vav. And there is a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. In this case, I mean literally, because the Gemara in Ahmed Bey's discusses the directive that one should always turn toward the right. This is a pervasive value statement which comes up in numerous halachos. The right side is treated as more important. Peleyowitz, under the entry Yamin, lists several halachic procedures that should be done right side first. The right shoe is placed on first. The right side of a garment is to be put on first, especially on Erev Shabbos. Or the right hand should pick up the washing cup, give it to the left hand, have the left hand pour the water over the right hand to suggest that the right hand is dominant and the left is subservient to the right. He hints at mystical reasons, although he does not specify other than to say that it is an ancient tradition. Mishnah Bura in, uh, in um, uh, a tough Resh Nun Aleph, Yud Beis, and Tesfav talks about using the right side also with the Arba Minim. Let's discuss the concept. The general idea seems to be that the left side represents the other side, the Sitra Achara, which is a Zoharitic term for the forces of evil and corruption that are part of this part of this world that we have to deal with. These various rituals represent ways to enact a victory of good forces over evil forces. Now, there is a dispute amongst Jewish philosophers as to whether evil exists as a personified entity. That is, is evil merely the absence of God's presence that is necessary in order for the physical world to exist? Or does it actually represent a category of divine agents who carry out and allow for evil? The reason being that God needs evil to exist and that people can choose to do good. In other words, without evil, there is no good. A world filled with total light will be as dark as a world filled with total darkness because there's no contrast. There'd be no way to see the difference. An example of this basic argument can be seen in the Ramban and Vayikra, Perak Tes Zayin, Pasuches, where he elaborates on a matter that Ibn Ezra hinted at, the purpose of the Seir La'azazel, the scapegoat brought on Yom Kippur. While Ramban is careful to say that this is not a sacrifice to the devil per se, as of course that would be idolatry, it is a command by God to offer this scapegoat to enable the evil forces to speak positively about the Jewish people. The rationalist philosophers, though, see evil as not a true entity, but rather a metaphor for the de facto entropic forces that manifest itself in places where God's presence is withdrawn. On this side, we find Rasajagon taking the other extreme. In the beginning of Eov, Satan challenges God's statement praising Eov for his piety, suggesting that Eov is not pious only He's really not pious. He's only pious because he lives in such material success with good fortune and health and, and family, etc. Rav Sajik cannot abide with this idea that God can actually create evil. In his introduction to his commentary on the book of Eov, Rav Sajik declares Satan as a metaphor standing in for the peers and countrymen who doubted and complained about Eov's sincerity and piety. But there was no Satan, not a real devil with horns. In any case, we see two different ideas about the personification of evil forces in the world, real or metaphor. In truth, this dispute can also be seen as a machlokas tanoim. The Gemara and Sanhedrin on Tavtsadiyom and Aleph records a dispute between Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Akiva about the authenticity of evil powers in the world. Specifically, if an idolatrous prophet who works a miracle is doing so via trickery or actually has tapped into some malign dark forces. And Rabbi Yosef Aglili says that, that indeed the power of the, of the false prophet, the power of the idolatrous prophet, is tapping into evil potential and evil forces that really exist. Rabbi Akiva says, Chas Shalom. Rabbi Akiva says that, that it's all illusory, it's, it's smoke and mirrors, only a true prophet of God could perform miracles. After all said and done, we cannot stop being human, and we need stories and myths to tell us how to make sense of the world. Even in modern times, when people do not usually believe in demons and such, we create our own mythologies. We no longer can tell ourselves the source of our compulsions and addictions are the result of demonic possession. So instead, we label the sources of our problems in living as diseases, 
chemical imbalances, our mothers hating us, and many other internal narratives. I'm not diminishing this idea. Our difficulties in life and internal pains do indeed come from somewhere, and we need to explain it to ourselves. I'm rather pointing out how important it is to recognize that as humans, we need a narrative. We need to be heroes in an epic story in order to give our lives context, focus, and meaning. If we are fighting true demons or psychological demons, it is real. That is why, regardless of whether you believe in the tangible reality of evil or the metaphor of evil, the internal reality is the same. We ever presently feel that there is a dark side to the world, and we oftentimes fear we will become victims to it or join forces with it. This is what the sages wanted us to be attuned to. In these oft-repeated daily rituals, there is an opportunity for mindfulness and growth to transcend evil potential that surrounds us if we are to be honest with ourselves.